Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone this morning? Isn't it been a great conference? This is my first opportunity to be at the conference, and so I have to tell you how impressed I am uh, with all of the speakers and with just the organization that goes behind it. So, General Pollitt, to you and your staff, congratulations on just a tremendous, tremendous event. Um, I am just so honored and pleased to be here this morning, uh, and I'm actually also so excited about the theme of this year's conference. Um, one of the things that many of you have heard me talk about before, and you'll hear us talk a lot about this morning, uh, is the importance of us at DOD looking at ourselves as an enterprise and looking at how we are going to connect uh, from the halls of the Pentagon, as hard as that may be at times, um, out to those in the, th in the theater that we really need to make sure that we are always focused on and always supporting. Uh, for those of you that were here earlier in the week, you had an opportunity to hear the deputy speak, um, and he talked about two themes, and I want to carry those over to today um, in this very important session. And that is he talked about the cybersecurity challenges that we have, um, but he, he talked about those in light of the fiscal challenges we have and the need for us to look at ways to operate more effectively and more efficiently. And while in some cases we might think of those things as being very separate in terms of how do we grow cyber capability at the same time we're looking at shrinking budgets and we're looking at the need to be more efficient, interestingly enough, they are not separate. And they come together in very, very important ways because it gives us now an opportunity to look at how we can operate more effectively and what that means in terms of consolidating our services, bringing our services together, but not in a way that damages or hurts our ability to, to actually deliver, but in many ways provides the ability to deliver in the way that we all want to moving forward. So it's really my privilege today to invite um, the individuals who are so important to making this happen. And as I mentioned to them this morning as we are chatting, the individuals who will be on the stage with me actually represent the enterprise. Uh, they are the organizations that are making it happen and are the organizations that are going to make the enterprise and the power to connect uh, really a priority uh, and going to make that feasible and it's going to make it what's going to be the way that we're going to operate in the future. So first I'd like to introduce General uh, William Lord from the Air Force. Bill's been um, a tremendous partner and uh, he's going to talk about some of the great things the Air Force is doing. Um, secondly, General Susan Lawrence. Many of you, I'm sure, all know Susan and uh, she's done some fabulous work at Army. Um, Admiral Kendall Card from the Navy, who I think many of you do know. Um, and again, Navy's doing some great things. And finally, General Kevin Nally from Marine Corps. Um, who's doing some also great things in the area of energy efficiency, and we're going to talk about those going forward. So please. So what we decided to do this morning is to try to keep this from being a really formal panel. And I was thinking about as I was getting together this morning, I think I'm going to be more Katie Couric or something. I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what the, right, um, what the right analogy or the right comparison is, but it's going to be much more, I think, around some healthy discussion, because I think we're doing things in a very similar way, but we got some differences in terms of the way we're approaching things. Um, you know, we get together monthly uh, to talk about sort of what our different challenges are, and it's been really a great opportunity uh, to really see how we got different ways of doing things, but at the same token, I think the way we do things can really inform uh, going forward. So I thought I'd start with a number of topics. The first one I thought was really around this question of consolidation, uh, because consolidation has been sort of our way of addressing the, uh, the enterprise effort. And so I thought one of the places to start, because you always want to have a little bit of controversy uh, and a little bit of discussion, <laughs> is to start with um, the, uh, the work that Army has done um, around the enterprise email solution. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm really interested in, General Lawrence, is, you know, sort of what motivated that? Um, you know, what are some of the things that you're seeing with it? And then obviously the big question that's out there for folks is, you know, how is it working? What does a pause mean? Uh, and, you know, how are you looking at it going forward? Okay, ma'am. She did not mean to equate controversy and me, <laughs> really. <laughs> but 
<laughs> no, no, we're excited. So why enterprise email? So as we're looking at, uh, I've been, been in the position five months now, and I, I look at where we need to be going. I said, I, you know, we just can't be fighting the current palm. We've got to put our goal out there. And so next week you'll hear Land Warden, and I'll talk about the network of 2020 powering America's army. And that's because I can influence three palms on my watch as we're going through this. So as we look at the foundational need to get to this network of 2020, this is the year, the next 24 months, is the must roll up our sleeves and get the foundation built in order to achieve it. And so when we talk about enterprise email, we get a tendency to just get wrapped up in it's about the email. Right. It's not about the email. It's about single identity management so that I can take my CAC card and go anywhere in the world into a government computer and the network will recognize me as we're doing that. Um, and so the three foundational things that we're working on is the enterprise email, the single identity, where we put our data to access it, the data center consolidation work we're doing, and then how we're gonna collaborate and fight out there and communicate, and that's the enterprise collaboration services that we're now gonna kick off uh, here in the next 60 days as we work through it. And so those three things are foundational to being able to go anywhere, anytime, little to no notice, train as we fight, and the network identify Susan Lawrence as we, go, as we do it. So we, um, we took off in this journey and we said, we are gonna be bold and audacious. We are gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna turn over a thousand a night. We're gonna be done with this and we're gonna, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off. We're just gonna rip that thing off and we're gonna be done in nine months. And so we took off like gangbusters. And in fact, we have over 90,000 users on enterprise email today. I've been on it since March. And um, what we did, what happened was second and third order effects. What we uncovered was an extremely, extremely dirty network. And so, and, and by putting everybody into this enterprise environment, we found we had 10 years of over 300 DAAs thinking they owned the network. We had found firewalls where there shouldn't be firewalls. We had software that couldn't talk to another software. And um, so we had to bring a team together and literally just clean up the network. And so that was the operational pause because I said, yes, we can continue to migrate. We can continue to put people over there, but why? Let's, let's stop. Let's clean up the network because it's, it's key to everything that we're doing. And then we'll go back at it. So we're gonna do a test of 10,000 here uh, next week, and we'll pause again for a few days, and General Pollitt and I will get the, the feedback and the AARs of how it went, and, and are we on track? And if we're a go, about one September, we're gonna rip that Band-Aid off again, we're taking off. Uh, and we'll be done by the second quarter in 12, as we do it, so we're excited about it. And, um, but the second thing we learned was how we communicate with our joint partners and the TTPs because we're crossing the boundaries here. And when we do the enterprise email in phase one, it's not just Army, it's Transcom, UCOM, AFRICOM. And so just talking the same language and with DISA in partnering with them was just getting our TTPs down. So, so good second and third order effects out of it. <laughs> well, General Nelly, I know you've been through uh, a consolidation, if you will, or bringing email together. And we talked about lessons learned that uh, certainly you can share with Army in terms of what, what it takes to make it happen. Well, good question, ma'am. Some of the lessons learned are one is the latency issues, uh, the, the size of the mailbox is an issue. And since we're under NMCI with HPES, those are services that we have to pay for on that Nippernet side of the house which is a small piece of our network under NMCI. But again, latency was an issue. How are we gonna deploy it was another issue. Um, size, of the, size of the mailbox, is it mobile? Can you log in if you're at uh, Camp Lejeune and you're stationed at Camp Pendleton? Um, so, that, so those are some of the issues that we had to overcome. But the, uh, the funniest one, I, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny, it was the size of the mailbox <laughs> issue was, a few weeks ago, uh, my commandant, bless his heart, General Amos, had an email issue. So he's been authorized a certain large size of account due to his requirements. So one night, I call it the Lance Corporal at midnight theory, 
going through the scan of the network, decides that this gentleman doesn't need a four gigabyte box anymore. He's going to get a one gigabyte box. And <laughs> when the commandant gets upset with me, he calls me Kev. <laughs> so he, he called me. For some reason, I had my Crackberry on. That's a Blackberry. I call it a Crackberry. At 2200 at night, and he calls me. He says, Kev, got some issues here. So we overcame that. But again, uh, <laughs> I think a lot of it boils down to training, training and education. And the best IT is a well-trained workforce um, that, that adheres to certain standards and certain disciplines, understands the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and doesn't take it upon themselves to fix the network, if you will. General Lord, I know um, you've been working for some time on uh, network and network consolidation. I think even ahead of some of our drive for efficiencies, with some of the challenges that you've had, maybe you could talk about what you've been able to do and also kind of what prompted your moving into the work you've done on the network. Yeah, the, the, um, I think the positive thing was, uh, was about nine years ago, um, and this goes to advocacy and cultural change, uh, we had a very forward-leaning uh, Air Mobility Command commander, General Tony Robertson, who said, hey, what's all this consolidation stuff about? Um, and so explained it to him. And so I think the number one lesson learned that we have is advocacy. Advocacy at the, at the senior level. It's easy for those of us that are techno geeks to come and say, well, you tie the red wire to the green wire, and you do this in SQL, and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, you have lost uh, uh, some of our senior leaders who... Who, uh, who clearly can understand this stuff but don't have time to understand the technical difficulties or, or technical uh, depth that, uh, that we need to go to to do it. So, so, uh, so advocacy and push from, uh, from a senior leader in the Air Force is what, what began our journey. Um, within uh, Air Mobility Command, we took 70,000 email uh, accounts and consolidated those and said, you know, the next thing really is, is consolidation of of almost 220 separate networks in the Air Force. And we, we used to have kind of a mantra, you know, one Air Force, one network. Um, and and uh, if I can get to one Air Force uh, 10 or 15 networks, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy. Um, and, and one of the reasons is, is the difference in the way we use networks. Um, the Air Force Academy, Air University, uh, the Air Force Institute of Technology, who want to correspond with with uh, uh, professors in, uh, around the world, you pick your favorite nation, um, we may not want to be on the dot .mil domain. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Um, the areas that we do research where we want to exchange data with other people uh, who are outside of the dot .mil domain, maybe we need to have some separate kind of barriers. And so, so have, I backed off the mantra of one Air Force, one network, but uh, we have gone from one Air Force down to about 15. So, uh, so four-star advocacy, scope was another uh, thing we had to help, help define for, uh, for all of us. Um, what is it we're going to do? And then go and get the funding to do that. In Air Mobility Command, the, the boss gave me $25 million. Uh, so with his advocacy and his money, things became a little bit, e a little bit easier. Um, but uh, uh, the, the IT efficiencies of late, uh, I think, have given us, and I know I call it a burning platform, and I view that as positively. I view this as a, as a, as a challenge of a place that we wanted to go inside the Air Force that we needed the advocacy, and in this case, it was, a, it was a, a both uh, an efficiency, but more importantly, I think, an effectiveness thing that, uh, that we needed to go after. So the combination of, of the right resources, the right advocacy, and a little bit of a burning platform uh, that we could use uh, has been, been enormously important. Um, our problem, uh, quite frankly, in the Air Force has been that the Air Force, let, let me back up. Uh, so in 1972, the, the guys at, uh, at um, Bolt, Baranovich, and Newman in, uh, in Chicago get this fax, right, from the University of Chicago and said, hey, could you tie a couple of universities together? And I said, yeah, we could. I don't know why anybody would. And DARPA kind of began the, the, what we now know as the Internet. Um, inside the Air Force, the networks have grown up the same way. 
kind of independently as, in some cases, a function of advocacy of the four-star commander. Well, if you were a network person, you maybe got a lot of money and you maybe have a... And so all of a sudden we have this, uh, this non-homogenous network that we're trying to homogenize because we use business best practices now as an example of how you can run uh, networks with, with millions of people in it, not just an Air Force with 700,000 people in it, um, and do that much, much more effectively. And so, uh, so as a result, um, we're now trying to use the advocacy, the money, the business best practices to drive a little bit of, of budgetary pressure to drive what was really a place we wanted to go anyway. Well, I know, Ed McCarty, you've got your challenges in terms of what's in the air and what's on sea as, as well. And I know you're aggressively pursuing data center consolidation. And I don't know whether the group is aware, but um, one of the things that the Navy's moved out on is make, taking a pretty firm stand on uh, new data centers or new space as you look to consolidate. Um, so what do they, what, you know, how does that actually work for the Navy? Well, man, we're trying to put together all the pieces. I mean, you heard Susan talk about, you know, commitment. You, the Marine Corps governance, when the Commandant speaks, they listen. Air Force, uh, you know, as, as he's talked about, as Bill's talked about advocacy here, we're trying to put all three of these pieces together at uh, one time. And uh, we're getting strong support, uh, obviously, from the Chief to, to help move this along. And, and to do that, Really, we've come up with uh, uh, three pieces of governance that I think are going to help us long. You know, essentially, as Bill said, we've had the same, General Lord said, we've had the same problem. We've had all of our budget submitting officers control. Everybody's got a great ideal. They all, they all want to be agile. They all want to move forward. And uh, they've done that aggressively over the last three to four years. But as a result, we have a lot of disparate networks and folks who can't communicate very well together. So uh, we've got to put those pieces together. So the first thing we, essentially we did is a data call to try to try to find out where where all the money was and, and what everybody had. And as we did that, we said, okay, the governance has got to come into place now. So I think I've convinced the current uh, Chief of Naval Operations and and uh, of course, Admiral Greenert takes over uh, September 23rd, uh, right behind him. And I think I've convinced him as well that, that we need a three-pronged plan here. And one of them is a single resource sponsor. Uh, that would be the N2N6. Uh, and so we'll approve anything over a threshold. Right now, we think that's about $250,000 or so uh, that the BSOs do. The second is, to really find out what we're spending, everybody's got to go, go through a single IT procurement authority. And right now, I think that's going to be spay war, but we'll see how that folds out. And that, that's the only way that we think that all the way down to printers, you know, from, from big pieces down to printers, that we can really get a handle on how much we're spending on IT and start controlling this with uh, single contracts uh, to folks. And then the third piece, which is uh, probably the most controversial but needs to be done is a single technical authority. Uh, uh, and of course, the folks who build ships and build airplanes, that's not an easy thing for them to say, okay, I'm going to have a single IT tech authority that I'm going to have to work with every day to ensure that it gets it. But it's the only way we're going to ensure that we get this right in our systems. Because as you know, as we've built new ships and new platforms in the past, particularly ships, as they've come out of the shipyard, they've done their initial fit, they go, back into, they go back into the yards to get their new IT suite before they do the first deployment. And that's just not an affordable way of doing business. And finally, the data center consolidation piece is kind of our fourth initiative here to really work aggressively to use uh, what my joint partners uh, have done before us and really make headway in this. We've worked hard to reduce the number of networks as General Lord has, uh, but we really need to get this data center consolidation uh, under control. I'm talking about uh, one-fifth to one-tenth of what we have now today. And we see uh, considerable savings through that initiative. Well, Kevin, from a financial standpoint, I think you've actually done much of that governance and consolidation. In fact, you approve purchases in what, what range? 
uh, between 25,000 to 155,000. Anything below that threshold, I don't see. So I didn't create the process, I inherited it, which I really uh, believe in. But any IT procurement at all has to go into our web based ITPRAS. It's an IT procurement resourcing system. And individuals, I have action officers, it's, before it gets to my level, I have action officers that see it, uh, personnel at Mark or Syscom, chop on it, and then once I finalize it, finalize it, it goes back to Mark for Mark or Syscom for procurement. So it, it's a it's a good way of tracking how much we we spend and what we spend it on. Granted, there are gaps in it, so I'm not going to say it's perfect because it's not. But it's a good way to track what we spend money on, ma'am, and where it goes. As as we have watched uh, how the Navy and the Marine Corps team have done this. Um, my Air Force IT budget is, uh, is about $7 billion. And in fact, we have found we spent $11, 12 $13 billion in IT. I said, so where's this money coming from? And so we have taken a lesson from the Navy Marine Corps team uh, and added the auditors, watch out, the green eye shade folks, uh, who are going to tell us where that money is actually coming from. And maybe we need to, to reconcile those accounts, not hoover that up. That would be tantamount to communism, but, uh, uh, but hoover it up. Uh, um, but but to, to get an accurate uh, kind of true accounting of this, because we know there's an enormous amount of just yearly O&M money that gets migrated in, and, and without a little bit of governance structure like, uh, like you folks have, um, you have well-intended Americans going off, and, and while we have all the trains headed west, some of them are going to end up in San Diego, and some are going to end up in Seattle. So we've, we've learned a good lesson from our joint partners. Joe Lawrence, one of the, uh, what, what I consider to be bold things that you've done in your enterprise email consolidation is uh, to look at the way that just something as what would be seemingly simple or straightforward as the way that Army does email addresses and the way that's going to work within the directory. Um, and so I'd be interested to hear how you, how you decided that and then maybe observations from our other, other members of the group uh, in terms of what they see as the advantages and disadvantages of that. Yeah, that, that was an interesting day. <laughs> so the team came in to brief me on the addressing scheme and of course we had to follow uh, the DOD policy on, on how, how we're gonna do it. Um, and so they came in, they says, well, now, to, to do it so that we can get the at army.mil at the end, we got, to, we got to be able to do this, and we're going to have to rework this server, and we're going to do it. And I looked at him, I go, what do you mean at army.mil? And they go, well, yes, ma'am. I mean, they're going to want at army.mil. I said, no, they're not going to get at army.mil. This is a joint network that we're building here. So the address is going to be at mail.mil. And so they looked at me and they go, well, I sure made it easy on us. And off they went. So I sent an, a, an email to my, my wingmen here and my <laughs> fellow guys. I said, hey, guys, we're moving out. We're going at mail.mil. And, uh, <laughs> and I got notes back and they said, well, Susan, I'm not sure we're going to be able to sell that <laughs> in our service. <laughs> so more to follow on that. But I promise you the underlying address will be at mail.mil. Right, right, but they right. may still have to have their service uniqueness there. Comments we, from the group? Right, right. We, have, we have to fake it. it was, uh, it's almost cultural. It's like william.lord at pentagon.af.mil. You can also get william.lord at us.af.mil. But imagine a blue suit guy trying to get rid of the AF in there. <laughs> it's cultural, um, but we can fake it in DNS. We can. So, we so, can. so uh, we'll have to have it. And uh, uh, and and, and I, don't, I, I think that's, that's temporarily cultural. I think we can get there as a, as a DOD, but you have to kind of, we have to work the, the eaches of that. And I would say, Lord's personal opinion, is that, uh, that it says .af.mil, if that's uh, the thing that ties me to an Air Force, then I have, lift, I have lost some other larger cultural problem. But we gotta get through the cultural barrier. Right, right. Uh, I'm See, absolutely but, sure if the DOD CIO told us we had to, that we'd be doing <laughs> we, we, tomorrow. There you we'd go, be there, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> A little I bit of direction. I don't know, General <laughs> not feeling too good about that on the end. <laughs> not so fast, sir. <laughs> Our, our, our ethos will not allow 
<laughs> but at usmc.mil. Period. End of discussion. I, I, did, I did take a note on that one, though. Okay. <laughs> Well, let's move on to technology um, and some of the areas that we're going. And I'm sure we'll get to another one that, that General Nelly will really love, too. Um, you know, one, as many of you know, one of my probably most non-favorite terms is cloud computing because I'm not sure I know what it means, and it's got so many different meanings, I'm not sure what, what exactly to do. But having said that, you can't have a discussion about technology without saying something about some kind of cloud computing, I guess. So, General Lauren, I'm going to turn it to you because okay. I know you've done some thinking. Um, and just give us a view of what your thinking is. I mean, you know, we talked a lot about the security implications of cloud, you know, the fact that, you know, we're going to be moving in many cases more towards a private cloud construct, but kind of looking at the capabilities and the possibilities around commercial clouds. And one of the things that um, my office is working on is this question of as we move to commercial cloud, what does that have to be for DOD? Um, and what security measures do we need and how can we make sure that our industry partners are working with us so that they're prepared from a security perspective to give us what we need. But what's the thinking in the Air Force? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, supporters. Um, I would like uh, uh, General Pollitt to be the cloud provider for us. Um, what, does that, what does that mean? I think that's more than just uh, moving servers into a deck. That's virtualization of applications, uh, which gets us to maybe thin client, which then gets us to maybe solving the multi-level security problems um, or issues. Uh, uh, it potentially even gets us to the point where we can be device agnostic at the edge of the, of the enterprise, so we get out of this battle of, of uh, uh, what favorite OEM provider you, you want to use. Uh, uh, does uh, uh, can you use a slate? Can you use a power book? Can you use a playbook? Can you use a um, uh, an iPhone, a Mac, an iPad? Uh, would like to see that device device agnostic. Um, I think to get there, we need the power of the cloud. As you're right, you can't swing a dead cat in this room without hitting the def definition of the cloud. Um, and I know that uh, for as many vendors as there are in here, they will line up between our building and Roslyn to tell us how to provide that and how you can provide the security. Um, and I think those are all things that, that we're not sure about. Um, not disbelieving, just not sure yet, at least in, inside the Air Force. So want it to be a place um, that could be private cloud, could be public cloud, could be hybrid cloud. Um, and I think we can use a combination of all of those. Uh, right now, I would tell you that the Air Force is leaning towards, towards DISA, towards General Pollitt and Alfred Rivera uh, to, to stand up those, those things. And I think more importantly is how do I migrate from where I am to the cloud? And, and I know that industry has got some great ideas on how to do that. Um, that I think the devil is in those details, not the end state. It's how to get from where we are to that, to that end state. So supporters... Uh, leaning towards the joint solution um, uh, right now. That's great. That's great. Well, and I think you've made a good point. I think that the question on cloud and one of the importance, uh, one of the important aspects isn't just the consolidation, but it's really the question of how do you get to the point where you're device agnostic, if you will, in terms of the way that we get to data and we get to data in a, in a shared way. Um, and General Lawrence, I've been intrigued by, you know, your thinking on what to do about the challenges we've got with all of these commercial devices hitting us. I know, you know, my office has been struggling with, you know, what are the information assurance ground rules for that? Um, it's not going to ever be one device. It's going to be different devices at different times. But it's one thing for us to think about how you certify to the network, but you have the challenge of actually how do you deploy all of these different devices in some rational way. Um, and, and I know you've given that a lot of thought. Be interested in your comments. <clears throat> well, our, our real game changer, ma'am, is the, uh, the common operating environment that we're implementing. Whereas um, we're, we're identifying seven computing environments. And the key is that, and if, if you can imagine, here is the network, is the, is the terrestrial, the aerial, and the space. And that's what we're going to work on. But on these edges, um, because I really had to change the way I was thinking. The diagram that you all have seen, and you'll see it next week again, is the, 
the divide between where industry is going and the department is just getting wider and wider. Uh, industry is just moving out, changing, and looking technology innovators, going to the next level. And we're sitting here and you're, you're on 4G and the son of 4G and we're sitting there now just talking about 3G. And so I said, okay, we, how do we close that gap? And I finally figured out there's no way we're going to close that gap. We have to eliminate that gap. And the way we do that is through the common operating environment, set the technical standards that on the back end, whatever computing unit is going to come in or application, it just meet, that must meet the common operating environment technical standards before you get to come in and play on the Army network. And then on the front end, on the device, the same thing. I've got to quit chasing these devices, these next toys, the next mobile great thing. Um, and so what we've got to do is now set it must meet these technical standards, these security measures, which are very important, because we're going to let you on to this network. I have to know that you are operating inside a protected trust environment as you're doing it. So that's what we're going to work on are the edges and not, not get rat, let every back-end computing device turn my network upside down and every new toy that comes out turn the network upside down as we go through it. Just if you want to operate in this environment, here are the technical standards you will test to and this is what you'll meet to, to be able to do that. And uh, so we're, we're getting some good traction on it, and we're going to test it uh, on the mobile devices for the first time at our network uh, uh, integration evaluation down at Fort Bliss in October. So one of the computing environments is the mobile devices. Uh, so we're going to have them come in and test to that point and see what we get. Mm -hmm. And that'll be our first attempt at it. And what kind of, I know in the Navy you've done uh, numerous pilots, and uh, I think particularly you're doing a lot with iPhones and iPads. How's that going? Uh, actually, it's going uh, fairly well. Uh, the uh, Secretary of the Navy has some general interest in, uh, <laughs> in uh, iPhones and iPads and being able to use those. And, and as, as General Lawrence said, it really is just a matter of of identification and building that trust uh, into the system. Uh, we're also going to do uh, a thin client uh, pilot here uh, in the next few months, and uh, I think that uh, we'll reach uh, success with that as well. I, I would like to, to pile on on Bill Lord's question uh, about the cloud. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important pieces that we're trying to leverage in the cloud is that as, uh, the intelligence community has essentially built a cloud architecture uh, with fairly uh, uh, robust standards, uh, et cetera, uh, over the last 10 or 12 years uh, through, through a lot of industry partnerships. And so we think that that's where, in terms of tasking collection, processing, exploitation, and dissemination, TCPED, we need, that's where we need to start. We need to leverage that cloud uh, as we move out here. And so that's a very important piece of uh, I think our overall future. Uh, and the ability to plug and play into that cloud with these devices is also part mm -hmm. of our future. Well, and I think one important thing uh, about the intelligence community, the cloud, and the, the work that NSA has done also, um, is also from an information sharing perspective and the ability to get to a, a, just a huge quantity of disparate data. Yes, um, and I think that's something going forward that, uh, you know, is very important. But, um, another area that I want to make sure we can covered I, is can the I jump work in real that, quick yeah, before you get ahead. on your next topic, is on the cloud computing. I think I'm I'm very adamant about, or when I say I, it, the Marine Corps is very adamant on being able to deploy the cloud in the most austere environments and aboard uh, our, our the ships with our Navy brethren. So, 31 years in the Marine Corps, first time in D.C. It's some of the meetings I go to, it's kind of interesting that <clears throat> if you, the concept is if you solve the issue inside the beltway, it's good to go. So when you mentioned you need to bring it out to Afghanistan or aboard a LHD or LPD, <clears throat> it's kind of like, well, why would we want to do that? So I think we, for industry, no matter what we talk about, whatever type of cloud we go to is how are you going to deploy it? And then on the mobile devices, um, I don't use mobile devices. <clears throat> I call them iPads, Kindles, Bindles, and Windles. But I did, a, but I did approve uh, Kindles and Pad type devices for our pilots in Afghanistan. 
Now, granted, you can't, they're not authorized to hook them up to the network, but what the young pilots have convinced me is that instead of taking, taking 50, 60 maps, sticking them in a bag, sticking it in between the pilot and the co-pilot, when it's a safety issue, leaning over and grabbing a map, but we download maps, unclassified maps, on these pad devices, and they Velcro them to their knee, and that's how they operate now. With the, they, they grew up this way, hitting different applications. And lastly, on the mobile devices, if whatever type of phone we get to <clears throat> for DOD, please remember industry that we have to deploy it. And when you deploy a cell phone or any type of phone, you got to have the second, third order effects is what are you going to put on the back end to be able to operate that device? Because most places that we go, there is not an infrastructure in place. So I got a phone, but I got to have connectivity. Can I pile on to that? I, I think that um, we also has to have to have uh, in the in the data center consolidation arena that uh, that that talks about cloud um, and apples to apples comparison on cost, right? Because as we as we look at at private cloud versus public cloud versus uh, a, a DISA deck potentially provided cloud. Um, you know, always the issue of cost comes up, and we need to make sure that that in the business case analysis right. uh, we're we're comparing the the same things and and oftentimes I see we we are not right. Right. one other aspect of mobile computing I know that the Marine Corps really looked at Hill Nally is this question of how many batteries do you have to carry around and how many devices oh. do you need to carry around and I know that's been a real <laughs> priority for the Marine Corps, and you've done some really interesting innovative things to take a look at that. Yes, man, that's a good point. The <clears throat> Commandant, a year or so ago, stood up an ener energy efficiency office to look at how can we save energy and be more green IT, not just in IT, but in tanks, planes, trucks, you name it, generators, electricity, heat, AC, et cetera. But speaking from an IT perspective, give me an example. They built uh, solar pads about three by five feet, very, very lightweight. The infantrymen and the communicators with the uh, infantry battalions put this in their backpack. <clears throat> they take one radio or one battery, put it in the radio, and carry only one extra battery. Third Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, one of the companies in that battalion, when they're in a Sanguine Valley in Afghanistan, went on a three week patrol with one battery in the radio and one battery in the backpack. Significant, significant reduction in weight. Since 9-11, the IT requirements have gone up for the Marine Corps 400%. The weight of that has gone up uh, 700%, and the battery requirements have gone up 1,294%. Mm -hmm. One of our battalion, infantry battalion commanders, when I got a chance to speak with him, he had just gotten back from Afghanistan, he said, sir, when you look at IT for the infantrymen, you need to consider the weight. He said, because the efforts that were put in to 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines on that three-week patrol significantly saved the amount of weight that an individual had to carry. So freeing up the batteries allowed that individual to carry more water and more ammunition and more food. But to me, more significant is that <clears throat> no one had to risk their lives to resupply that company for three weeks. Nobody had to drive or fly, and <clears throat> per 50 convoys, one Marine is killed and one Marine is uh, severely wounded. And you can, do, you can imagine how many convoys are going on throughout Afghanistan and Iraq every day. So those are the efforts the Commandant's putting at. So again, for industry, for the future, we, we, we as the Marine Corps are going to start looking at our IT buys of, of one is the weight and one how more energy efficiency have you made it. That's great. Thank you. Well, let's move on to another one of our favorite topics, cybersecurity uh, and the protect and defend aspect I, of your role. I got a great funny oh, story okay. to open that up, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> last year, last year, I'll make this brief. Last year when I got, first got to D.C., <clears throat> industry, you all would come to me and say, here, look at this pamphlet. We teach the cybersecurity courses. So after a while, I said, well, let's get all this information from industry. We got with FCA. We got with several banks, academia particularly the University of Maryland, we compared what you all teach to what we teach in the Marine Corps, and we were about 90% there. So I made the decision. I said, we're no longer going to call ourselves information assurance. We are now cybersecurity. 
Ray Latier, who heads up my cybersecurity division, within 24 hours had new cards made. <laughs> what it did was it opened doors for us. So we we're there about the same hundred percent of what you teach. But the how I really really know it's working is when I was in Hawaii several months ago talking to young Marina Canioli. I said, "Well, what's your MOS?" He said, "Well, I'm an 0651." I said, "Well, what what's that MOS?" He said, "Well, sir, I know you changed it. I'm now a cyber marine." <laughs> but seriously, I changed it. Our 0651s were the data marines. 0659s were data chiefs. 0689s were information assurance managers, and 0650s were our warrant officers who used to be um, data officers. Now it's a, data, a cyber marine, a cyber chief, cyber security manager, and a cyber, uh, cyber network operator. So anyway, this young marine says, yes, sir, I, I got the word you changed the name. Now I'm a cyber marine. I said, well, how's that working for you? He said, it's working great, sir. He said, six months ago when I got to Hawaii, I was down in Waikiki, and this is a true story. He said, I was down in Waikiki, and some young lady said, well, what are you doing in the Marine Corps? He said, well, I do that. And he said, she was absolutely bored out of her mind. <clears throat> he said, just a few weeks before you got here, I was back down in Waikiki at a pub, and some young lady came up to me and said, what do you do? And he said, I do cyber. He said, she was completely fascinated. <laughs> I know it's working. <laughs> General, you know, General Alexander needs to hear that story. Yeah, yeah. He'd be really excited by that. So what do you call yourself these days? Fascinating and frustrating. Well, as interesting as cyber is, not that interesting for all of us. That's actually better than what I've known. Um, I think one of the, the real big questions, you know, it was interesting that... Um, I was actually surprised at uh, one of the questions on, uh, on Monday for, or Tuesday for the deputy, which was the relationship between the CIO and Cybercom. Um, I think that that's an interesting question and, you know, one that, that we can talk about. But I think the, the, um, the more interesting piece is really the relationship between each of your organizations. Um, and certainly I know, for instance, the Marine Corps, the, the cyber and the um, CIO are a single organization, but I know in, in the other organizations, perhaps not quite so much. And I think we're still, maybe I'm not right, but I think we're still kind of working out that relationship. Um, and so I guess, General Lawrence, you know, your view on, uh, you know, the roles and responsibilities between the, you know, what the services need to do and then how they're going to be interacting with Cybercom as we really look at uh, both, the, both the protect and defend, but also, you know, from an offensive perspective, how that's right. going to work. Right. Well, I'm going to give you a schizophrenic answer. <laughs> um, it, it obviously keeps us awake up at night because we know that uh, this, the network is the most non-kinetic, vulnerable environment we could be operating in. And that's not just the Department of Defense. That's the banking systems. That's the power systems. It's, it's all of it as we look at, at that. And, uh, and the enemy is, uh, it doesn't take much money and it doesn't take much backing and, uh, and they're, not, they're not governed by law like we are on certain things. And, uh, and, and so they're a very uh, formidable enemy to us in that environment. But as we started down this route about two years ago in standing up Cybercom and how the services were going to do it and how we were going to look at it, um, I, I was watching this pendulum just almost swing out of control. And to the point that I finally got on a plane and came to D.C. and saw the chief of staff of the Army. And I said, you know, as we work our way through this, what we have to remember is the network is the center of gravity. So first, do no harm to the network. No matter what solution we come up with, do no harm to the network. And... Uh, because there were a couple of courses of action that just kind of excluded the network or took it apart or broke things up. And so those courses of action got taken off the table right away. Because I said, if, if, if you don't have the network, um, then there is no attack, there is no exploit, there is no defend. Uh, and so you got to first ensure there is the network. So computer network operations, the key is the big O, our ability to operate. And, uh, and all our missions as we're doing this. So yes, we're gonna, we've got to protect ourselves and, and there will be non-kinetic attacks and we'll do those things, but don't take your eye off the center of gravity and ensure that we're putting the right resources 
and the emphasis on that. And so we were blessed. That next year, uh, General Casey named the network the number one modernization effort. And so we really went through a, a great period of time of, of being focused on the network. And we're continuing to do that. But now there's this um, natural friction between resources. So as we're going down this budget shrinking environment that we're in, is uh, everybody's grabbing spaces and people and dollars. And, and, and I go back to, and I've gone back, in fact, to, a, to the new chief of staff, the 37th, and sent him a note and said, remember, sir, first do no harm to the network. So, <laughs> so it's kind of a schizophrenic. I, I understand uh, this, the, the cyber domain, the importance of it. The, the, um, it, it does keep me awake at night as we look at protecting our networks and, and our information. But at the same time, uh, let's not take our eyes off the ball of, of what we need to be doing as well. Uh, we have we found uh, in the Air Force uh, exactly the same thing, Susan. Uh, but I think there's a there's a Venn diagram that overlaps those responsibilities. Um, and if I can give you an example, um, we have expanded our work in the Air Force to not only the the network, but it's the work of the network. It's the data. It's the applications. So all of a sudden. Um, we have our, had our network defenders only looking at perimeter boundary stuff. Now maybe they need to look at the performance of applications uh, as an indication of a security problem or a performance problem. Um, and so you begin to, to, uh, to build this uh, defense in depth. What are we doing about, you know, one of the things I lay awake about thinking is, is when the next laptop goes missing that had 30,000 social security numbers on it because we haven't properly secured the data. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, uh, is in today's world, the attack vectors all of a sudden have, have shifted in the past couple of years from the network to the apps. And so this overlap becomes as I and my CIO role have um, a say and quite frankly have a hammer, have some authority in how an application gets built uh, to incorporate those things before it gets loaded on the network as opposed to security that's bolted on after the fact. Um, uh, one of the other lessons we learned from, from a discussion I had with Susan a couple of months ago is the downward directed network changes that we have to, to make almost instantaneously because attack vectors, new, new uh, um, uh, attackers, new attack tools become available and we immediately have to kind of patch those, uh, call it Patch Tuesday kind of things. Um, we traditionally, I think the Army took 73 million is the number I keep quoting, that the Army had to come up with just out of hide to be able to make those security fixes no notice. We as a, we as a community have to figure out maybe we need to have a pile of money that's akin to in the Air Force we have we have piles of money for claims. We have piles of money for, for potential hurricane and tornado damage. Money that we don't know if we're going to have to spend or not, but this is money perhaps we ought to also have set aside because we don't know if we're going to have to spend it or not. Right. And when we need to spend it, we need to spend it now. And quickly. Not, not enter the, right. the PPBES cycle <laughs> and get it five years from now. Yeah, so we're, we're exactly with you. Well, there's the funding cycle and then there's the acquisition cycle that right. goes with that to actually make that happen. From a Navy perspective, Admiral. Uh, well, I can tell you that as we've gone through this discussion, it mirrors what, you know, I, I happened to be at uh, NORAD Northcom a few years ago, and this was before the Taipo Dong 2 shot from North Korea. And so we're talking about the very limited number of ground-based interceptors that we have, and I had the opportunity to, to hear on the red switch, a discussion from the Secretary of Defense, three or four COCOMs, STRATCOM, about who was going to be, who was going to continue to support the system, and who, and who the trigger puller was going to be when the, when it came off the pad. And it's very much the same discussion that we're having with cyber and U.S. Cybercom today. So, I think we'll work it out in time. I'm an optimist, maybe, but I really do think we'll work it out in time because we've worked that uh, that out over the years and and. Uh, Right now, it's almost uh, the, authority, the, the authority with the most practice, okay? And who is that today? And, and that's a hard question to answer, uh, but I think General Alexander would say it, it's him. So, uh, 
And, right. and so I think we have to defer to that in this time, and then we have to continue to work this, these relationships out as we have with ground-based interceptors and authorities. Jill Nelly, in the Marine Corps, you have both, as you said, the cyber and the CIO responsibilities. So how do you, how, you know, how, what's, how do you play those off, and how do you actually make, have those work together? I'm not sure, ma'am. <laughs> actually, I have three jobs and two bosses. So I'm the director of C4, I'm the CIO for the Marine Corps, and I'm also the deputy commander for Marine Forces Cyber Command, which is a component of U.S. Cyber Command, which was recently stood up and is in uh, Columbia, Maryland right now. What I did last summer is I draw, drew a bubble and I put all the roles and responsibilities as a C4, C, uh, CIO, and cyber. And then what we did is we looked at where it was all interlinked and virt literally 95% of all those roles and responsibilities were all interlinked so we just put them all in a bubble and then just put the onesies and twosies on the outside because literally whatever I do as a CIO affects what's going to happen in the cyber realm with our networks. Whatever I do with a PRIC 117 Golf in Afghanistan tied to the CIPRANET, oh by the way, now it's part of cyber. So it's all interlinked, and that includes our base telephone infrastructure as well. So, but we're streamlined in the sense of, uh, since I'm the deputy commander from Mar4 Cyber, our McNosk and Quantico is opcon to Mar4 Cyber, and be, me being the deputy Mar4 Cyber, the commanding officer down there just has one boss. The same with the uh, the staff up at Mar4 Cyber at Columbia. Interesting. Let's move to the question uh, I think that um, is one that we teed up on Tuesday, and it's really around this big question of the big DOD enterprise. Um, each of you control your own enterprises, so you've been doing a lot to look at how you operate more effectively, whether it's networks, data centers, and, and as you look at mission. Um, but the bigger question, obviously, which sits out there for me is, how, and, and the interesting thing, I think, too, in, in talking with each of you in many different settings is that each one of you have been in a joint capacity as well. So you've had a services hat in your current role, but in the past and had, have been in that joint hat. And so you've seen the effects of, at least certainly as people have related it to me, you know, seven networks with seven groups coming in and trying to figure out how to make those work and understanding how to deal with um, what I think 12 email systems, if you count the coalition uh, issues that we have today. What are the things, I guess, as you think about sort of your a past role and now this, the services role and the responsibilities that you have, what are your thoughts about how do we actually get to enterprise? Uh, but I think General Nelly is the way that you always express it, but do it in a way that we have accountability, that we're making sure that we've got the services um, and with the small s, that we, we've got the accountability and that we're delivering in a reliable way to the edge when we're reliant on joint. Um, and I think that's one of our challenges, whether it's um, funding, acquisition, but, but you know, I think you're the ones that are going to make that happen for the COCOMs. And you get the COCOMs requests today, uh, but at the same token, I think certainly my perception, and you know, I'd be interested in yours. We're we got a ways to go. We're not there in terms of that thinking. So, I mean, what would be your observations about how do we get there? What are the things that we need to do? Yeah, I, I think you have to start uh, as as um, the previous vice chairman used to tell us: start at the end on the pointy end. Start at Afghanistan and work it back. Because today, uh, those of us who have been in CENTCOM know, um, and the current CENTCOM J6 has, uh, has, uh, has told us in, uh, in the last couple of COCOM J6 uh, conferences, that, that we all roll in as independent services, and then the integrating function becomes the, the guy or gal at the pointy end of the spear, and that's the wrong time, in my opinion, that's the wrong time to be doing that integration. So the trouble is we grow those, these things by services. Um, so I think there was a, there is a great role for, uh, for the joint staff. And I know General Medler is hiding down here. And, uh, and, and, and her boss, General Hawkins, and his boss, General Spencer, to, uh, to all of a sudden say, OK, we need to continue that mantra of starting the definition uh, at the pointy end of combat operations and building it back. 
not starting uh, in, uh, in the Pentagon on the Air Force uh, part of the E-ring and building out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I tell the war story uh, of our time <clears throat> over in CENTCOM, because over in Balad, and uh, I went to see the tech control facility. And uh, Air Force run tech control facility, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. So this was. So, but this so, is the Air Force story. It, it right, is. right, right, I know. So, so, okay. so I, I, I go in and, 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 and this young major is briefing me and he's all excited about all the work they've done and they just, and he says, and he had this, pulled out the big blueprint and showed where they ran fiber around Balad and, and how they're connecting everybody and how forward thinking they are. And I go, I said, well, that's great. I said, I don't see the airfield connected. Oh, we don't provide comms to the airfield. <laughs> Well, who provides comms to the airfield? Well, that's the Air Force. I said, well, you're the tech control facility for Balad. Well, no, they have their own. I said, where? <laughs> so I got in, my, got in my vehicle, went two blocks down, got out, and got into the Air Force's tech control <laughs> facility. And the kid brings out this blueprint, and he lays it all out, and he, and he says, and look at this fiber. I ran all the way around Balad. Now I'm connected. <laughs> and, then I, and then it just serendipity. 30 days later, here comes this PM from Kick and says, for $1.5 million, I can lay fiber for you at Balad. And I go, stop, stop the madness. <laughs> Just stop this madness. But the, that's the issue. And never, I mean, we should all be fired if we ever do this again. But again, remember, we were going into a war. And, and think about our wars over the last 20 years. They were 30-day events. So everybody wants to go fast. They want to go in fast because they don't want to, they don't want to miss the opportunity of going to the war. And so then they bring their everything themselves. For every future, uh, JTF exercise, whatever, we collectively need to come together and say who's the EA of the network and the rest of us need to shut up and fall in. Mm -hmm. And 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 mm -hmm. that's what we have to do in the future. So I guess if, uh, obviously she's right, but <laughs> <laughs> in, Thank you, in, yeah, in addition, uh, we, we have to think about a global architecture together. And, and uh, we sometimes forget, I mean, we are uh, heavily in Afghanistan and Iraq. All the services here today are, are heavily invested there uh, in the CENTCOM theater. But we have special operations forces all over the world today. I have submarines. Uh, all over the world today. And so, and, and every one of those in my mind is a node that needs to collect, that needs to connect to this global architecture. So as we, we need to think through this as a, you know, and put a joint uh, architecture globally so that we can connect in any time, anywhere, any place that we need to do. And, and uh, that Overall architecture needs to be designed, you know, from the warfighter out, as as uh, General Lord said, to ensure that we have this connectivity. Uh, if you look at the way, uh, uh, if you look at all the studies on the air sea battle, you know, there we have to be able to fight uh, connected globally, and then for consideration by industry out there, we have to, and a lot of folks spend a lot of time on this. We have to be able to fight possibly without satellites. And so how, how does the global architecture take that into account so that we're getting the minimum amount of bandwidth that we need to do our command, essential command and control and pass that essential information? So uh, it, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. our, our survival depends on it and, uh, and, and the war fighters uh, each and every day depend on our ability to do this. So I'm looking at if you, you know, uh, General Lawrence's service is focused forward. Uh, General Lord's service is focused uh, back in CONUS uh, in terms of moving data and especially in, in terms of where their analysts are. And uh, the, in the Navy, I'm a hybrid solution. And the Marine Corps, I take with me. And so, and then they're a hybrid solution to the Army solution as well when they're on the ground. So uh, we've got to develop these nodes and put these pieces together. There's challenges, right, as, as it extends beyond that, really, into our coalition forces, and particularly when we think about our humanitarian efforts. I mean, what are some of the challenges? Well, ma'am, the only thing I would add to what the, these gentlemen and uh, General Lawrence talked about 
because I agree with all of them. I would add that my recommendations would be, since we don't have an advocate on the J joint staff anymore, i.e. the J6 three-star is gone, is you're like our big advocate now, you and General Pollitt. And my recommendation is, I know you all are working on it, but you all publish the standards, and then we fall in underneath those standards. And then we build what I'll call a kit uh, <clears throat> that you can deploy in an exped expeditionary manner that is re reliable, redundant, flexible, and secure, and scalable, that when we do have to operate with our coalition partners or our allies or the interagency or the State Department or the Haitians, uh, or NGOs, uh, et cetera, that we can take this kit, what we need, in an expeditionary manner and then deploy it that meets the standards that you've laid upon us. But, but I think there are some, there are some work that, uh, that, that's currently being done in in cloud, that if you can deploy cloud, virtualize some of those things, all of a sudden, we, we don't have difficulty uh, exchanging data between uh, the U.S. and coalition partners. One of the big fears is the coalition partners don't want us to mistakenly share their data between That's them. Exactly right. yeah. um, and so all of a sudden, if you talk about this, this kind of forward cloud with virtualization, then you make role-based those coalition partners, all of a sudden you're not worried about all that darn hardware, which is what gets us in so much of a, a problem. What do we have? 16 networks going on, uh, not including uh, uh, the, the Afghan mission network. Right, um, right. So I, I think there's a, there's a technological solution in there, which we then have to, but, but start at the disadvantaged user whether that's the dismounted marine or soldier or, or subsurface force uh, or some pointy nose thing moving at high speed and then come backwards. So there's some technological uh, pieces in there, but then we need to, to harmonize that kit so that our deployable stuff in the Air Force and the tactical uh, deployable communications gear is the same stuff that you guys use. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's Crazy. As we're laying out our strategy, and I'm going to fight for the funding, uh, the one thing that has really, that I've been able to, to show the leadership is how important and how powerful this network can be. We now are putting the Afghan Mission Network in the headquarters of the next deployers. Jim Huggins, sitting in the 82nd Airborne Division today, has the Afghan Mission Network in his headquarters. Every day, he is connected to the unit that he's going to be replacing in September. He sits in every operational update. He sits in every intel update. He knows where he's going to fight. He knows his mission. And in fact, he just went through his MRX, his qualification exercise to get to the theater. And the OC said this was the best trained unit they'd ever seen, the most realistic. But that's because they had the Afghan Mission Network up and operating and participating in. So the only time he's going to be disconnected from his network and his data in planning and going into that theater is when he gets on the airplane and lands. And, and that's a game changer. It is a huge game changer. So we've, we've operationally proved the power of the network from the edge to the post camping station. And, uh, and so that's, that has been a, the one that I've been able to go in and Demonstrate. justify why we need to keep moving in this direction. I'd like to start to open it up to questions. So if people could start to move <coughs> to, the, to the microphones, and I'm going to struggle, I think, to see when I've got folks at the microphone. So I'll need uh, a page. Maybe you can help me out here by just um, making sure that I've got folks there. Oh, I've got some questions already. So OK, let's go ahead and start back here. OK. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is uh, Regina Haig Henriksen, and I work in the Army. So I'm sorry, mine's going to be kind of long. The DOD, in partnership with services, agencies, and vendors, have taken great strides in creating efficiencies in our IT infrastructure, such as consolidating data centers, moving to unified capabilities, and EOIP, and enterprise services. How will DOD be able to retain these efficiencies as we are reaching out to obtain and consume these IP services and applications in a strategic, fixed, and tactical environment without having to acquire more and more bandwidth capacity. And the two examples I give you is Mr. Chambers talking about VTC explosion um, and also the backbone going from 10 gig to 100 gig. 
So the concern is, it's great we're consolidating, we're having efficiencies, but the concern is, are we doing it at the risk of having to acquire more and more and more bandwidth? Thank you. Uh, Regina works for me. Regina, would you have that question answered by tomorrow night? <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to your briefing. <laughs> And, and I can't we, we were told to make them tough. <laughs> you know, I can't answer because I went to school in Kentucky and majored in agriculture. So I'm, 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 Regina, okay. let, me, let me jump in here. Um, yes, sir. Uh, no, that, that's, a, that's a great question because all of a sudden the concern is if you are that disadvantaged user that we were talking about, um, the, last thing, uh, the last thing you have you know, is a 30-meter dish to put on top of your submarine, you pick your, your, your poison. Um, so what we have been doing in the Air Force, in the ISR world too, uh, as an N2, N6, uh, A2, A6 uh, effort, is we begun, have begun to do processing uh, at the point where you're doing the collection. So all of a sudden, you're not moving all the full motion video all the way across the globe all the time. Um, and there's lots of uh, 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 great work going on, not only by DARPA, but, it, but, uh, but maybe by some of our industry partners in the room, to do the compression of algorithms so that's done at the sensor, not uh, back at the, at the analyst's station where we're trying to move all this stuff around. So it requires a different kind of processor in a different kind of a place. Uh, now, now, it's easy to say, harder to do, right? Yes, sir. That, that can yes, be sir. expensive. Yeah. I, I'd like to I'd pile on. You know, I always look at this as, as a triangle, sensors, processors, and transport. And sensors are going up, you know, into exabytes. And, and so, and transport is, you know, at, at very best, it's linear uh, while, while the sensor information is going up exponentially. And so processors and where we put them and where we put the people are obviously key to doing this, but we, we're also looking to, to stratify between tactical, operational, and strategic requirements. For instance, if you're on a carrier and I'm on a DDG operating in the South China Sea today, and I send you a CIPRANET email, it goes up to the satellite, down to the NOC. If I'm an 80S3 and you're two, it transforms it, sends it back to the satellite and back to you, even though we're a thousand yards apart. Okay, so I've got to be able to do a tactical layer to, to keep that away, to ensure that the bandwidth is controlled, you know. And there, there are lots of other, uh, you know, obviously dynamic bandwidth management, we're working hard to push that through, lots of different things. But for me, it's separating the requirements for tactical, operational, and strategic, <clears throat> and making sure that we also prioritize all of those in those three areas so that we can manage that bandwidth dynamically to our needs, with command and control being number one. Yeah. I, as a moderator, I'm going to just add my two cents worth, if you guys don't <laughs> mind. I think the other piece that um, is important in the, in the discussion is that, because I think you've, you've hit on something uh, which, it, which is also important, and, and that is that even if we didn't have the budget pressures that we have today, uh, we're not going to live in a world where we can continue to grow our technology spend without really being accountable for it. And, you know, we spend about 60% of our IT dollars, for those we can find, um, in O&M. And um, it's the importance is for us to continue to figure out ways to be more efficient and effective to drive that O&M dollar down so that we have the dollars to put into increased bandwidth and the new technologies that we're going to have to invest in. And that's an ongoing issue for us as we think about where we're going. Um, so I think that there's a dynamic there that, um, you know, this isn't a one-time effort. We would be faced with this no matter what, because even if we can grow our technology dollars some, we're never going to be able to grow them enough uh, to just have it be a continual add-on for the new technologies. And that, that I think that, you know, if I look at it on an overall perspective, because mm -hmm. bandwidth is just one of the things right, right. that we're going to have to spend dollars on from a technology perspective in the future. Yes, okay, Thank let's you. go to the center here, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mike Sinisi, ECS Incorporated. 
My question is about cyber warfare, since uh, we proved that data warfare is kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to be called cyber from now on. Yeah. Well, that's my, my question is, is, how are you trying to integrate the cyber warfare and the kinetic effects so that there's a synergistic battle plan and operation in the field uh, for the warrior? And how do you exercise those, those capabilities in the networks today? Do you want me to? Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a very good question, but I'm going to try, I'll keep, well, I will, I'll keep it at the unclassified level. All what you just asked is being done. <laughs> Appreciate the answer. But what, <laughs> which is a true statement. Um, but the other thing we've done in coordination with This Is Help is built out a cyber range, if you will. It used to be called information assurance range. Boring, now it's a cyber range. Everybody's fascinated with it. <laughs> um, so we, we, we can uh, test, evaluate, and now we're in the stages of operationalizing it so we will be able to use it for our, for our exercises, both for preparation for Afghanistan or any type of deployment or an exercise back here in stateside and oh, by the way, if you're at Camp Pendleton, you'll be able to access the cyber range, which is located in Virginia, without having to move Marines back and forth from Virginia to uh, Camp Pendleton. So it's a cloud kind of cyber range. So, but it's a good question to reassure you. It is being done. It's still uh, very much a work in progress, but there is a lot of progress that's being done. Marines, uh, sailors, Airmen and soldiers have been deployed overseas to do cyber kinds of uh, support element kind of work. So, so Mike, as, a, as an ex-Air Force colonel, you, you'll know uh, red flag, blue flag, uh, black flag, maple flag. Um, we, we have incorporated this play into every single one of those flag exercises. Um, they, uh, they are taught in, uh, in the weapons school out at Nellis. Uh, and our Joint Task Force Commander course, all services that goes on at Maxwell and the piece at Nellis, uh, incorporates all of that. I, I think we'll know we're there when, uh, when, when the, uh, uh, the, the CIFLIC or the CFAC um, uh, can look in, uh, in the JMIM, that database that you select weapons from, and you see a piece of software there along with a 2,000-pound bomb uh, or an M1A2 Abrams tank as a weapon of choice. And, uh, and we're getting very close to that. Yeah. Thank I, you. I, I agree. We're, we're full court press in this journey. And, and you know, from, from New York to L.A., we're about Philadelphia right now in terms mm -hmm. of con plans, O plans, and all the pieces. But, but there's no doubt that we're full court press. We're not going at 50 miles an hour here. We're, we're moving hard. Can I go with the side? Yep. No one's Good over point. There. Oh, no one's over there. Oh, no, nobody no. there. All right, All right, we'll go back okay. to the middle here. All right. uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your, uh, for your remarks uh, uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Don Ravel. I'm with Eating Corporation. Uh, my question, too, re revolves around cyber. Uh, my question really is with everything going on in the last 10 years associated with a asymmetric warfare, uh, irregular warfare tactics uh, seem to be the wave of the future. Uh, some people call this fifth generation warfare. Uh, kind of curious, as your role as a CIO continues to evolve, uh, how much emphasis uh, in terms of planning and consideration do you put into the electrical grid that supports all of the good work that you're doing in the infrastructure, uh, particularly how much on the reliable, the safety, the security of, uh, of, of power supplies that support your, your initiatives? Um. <clears throat> What we have learned is we're looking at our architectures. If you think about security afterwards and just put a box at the end, then you've already lost the fight. So as we're looking at our architectures and building our solutions, security is the number one thing we're looking at in our designs. Uh, we have to do that as we work through that. So um, it, recently we just also received a letter from OMB to the CIOs, empowering us more in looking at security of our information and the things that they want us to do. And so we're, gonna, we're assessing that 
and looking at what that means across the board. And so you'll see, you'll, you'll see some very hard-hitting policies that will come out holding individuals personally and fiscally responsible for the protection of our information as we work through this. Our, our, uh, our Undersecretary of the Air Force has asked me to speak at the next Air Force Energy Council where they're normally talking about saving gas, about energy security. We, uh, we recently have had our 24th Air Force do some evaluations against ICS and SCADA systems at some of our Air Force bases, and I won't tell you the results of that, but you can imagine that they're not wonderful. Um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, in the future, maybe the, the, no, the non-kinetic uh, weapon that creates a kinetic effect is the one that gets after the HVAC in this building and the escalators and the lights because we're all going to pour out into the street, right? And we didn't have to destroy the building. We created a kinetic effect with a non-kinetic weapon. And, and part of our, our probably hand-wringing is, is we won't be so quick to, to potentially use that capability until we're ready to receive that one back at us. And are the, the critical infrastructures of... Of, uh, of our nation ready? I don't know. Uh, inside the Air Force, I know we got work to do. So we're paying attention to that. I've made three trips to Idaho National Labs. Smart Grid, if you're familiar with that, um, holy smokes. Let's put a little two-way uh, RF chip in, uh, in every power meter in the United States. You think that provides a big attack surface for somebody to get into the grid? Also, I don't know. I'm not an electrical engineer, but... <laughs> Also, the Deputy Secretary has taken on, certainly in CONUS, with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the issue of critical infrastructure protection, um, not only working with the Department of Homeland Security, but also with the Department of Energy. And so I think, uh, you know, as you think about each of the services has obviously their own, uh, but I think there's a broader range issue uh, that's also being considered from the, the Office of the Secretary. Yeah. yeah I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, as a director of naval intelligence, I have a, a, lots of uh, discussions with uh, other service chiefs uh, from around the world, and I can tell you that there's a huge market out there around the world, uh, uh, in particular about cybersecurity and and how and where they need to start. I'm talking about at the at the very ground level, at the unclassified, almost ground level. There's a huge requirement and need out there for industry. Okay, can we go over this way? Thank you, ma'am. First, my name is Mark Cohen. I'm with BAE Systems. I would like to first thank everyone on the panel for their service and sacrifice to our nation. My questions have to do with things that we've heard over the last few days regarding culture change. Uh, in particular, I'd like to address both Ms. Takai and Admiral Card. Uh, when General Lawrence suggested at mill dot mill, the Air Force and the Marine Corps jumped up and said, I gotta have my identifier. If we can't incorporate a culture change at your level, how can we incorporate that change at lower levels? I would also propose, at least from the Navy side, the fleet gets it. I would also propose that the four stars, for the most part, get it. Where the biggest problem in culture change that I see is at the Echelon 2 level. So again, how do we propose to change the culture at that level. And we'll do on a start. Yes, I do. I, I would say that the initiatives that we have in place will more than just force the echelon twos to think about it, it'll force them to react uh, because uh, it's, it's uh, a, not a direct attack at their pocketbook, but it forces them to decide I'm not taking money from their wallet. It forces them to decide how they're going to spend their dollars. Are they going to spend it on bullets? Are they going to, you know, are they going to spend it on blackberries? Okay, and there is an appropriate mix. Uh, and as a warfighter, they need to make those. They need to 
they need to support their war, as an issue too, they need to support their war fighters and they need to understand that there is an appropriate mix there. Uh, heretofore, not as much uh, focus on, on that. We've built platforms, as you know, without, and the IT systems have come on last as, as, a, as almost an afterthought. And so I think that uh, these new initiatives will very much uh, force the S2s to more, uh, to, to attack their day-to-day -day solutions for IT with a different perspective, with a different culture. Thank you, sir. I, I would give you just a couple other perspectives. I, I actually think the fact that we're having a discussion about dot .mil, dot .mil uh, is the start point. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've had that discussion before. And um, maybe I sound like the eternal optimist, but of course I gotta be, otherwise I probably wouldn't have taken this job um, overall. But um, you know, I think we are. I mean, I think the dialogue's there. Um, I, I think it's gonna be tough. We're gonna have to do some of it by directive. What were your three Ds? Right, Susan? talking with industry and it is, they said the only way you are gonna get there is with the three Ds. Um, the first thing is that you've got to um, decide what, what it is you're going to do. You then are going to have to direct that it be done. And if you're not extremely draconian in your methods, you won't get there. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> so that's, that's exactly right. And, and it's, it's a combination of those things. Uh, there are going to be some things where we're going to work through them and get to a decision on collab collaboratively on what we want to do. But ultimately then, um, in order to get folks thinking it, we are going to have to do some directive things that are going to cause some antibodies and they're going to cause some angst. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things that I've said to folks is that if we look at something that we want to do and, it, and there's no controversy, then that must mean it wasn't worth doing. Um, it, it, you know, it's around us all having a good discussion about it and ultimately deciding how we're going to make that happen. Yeah. So um, it's not going to be easy and we're not going to get it all done, but I think we've got a lot of areas where we're going to be able to move it forward and shift that culture, not in one big swing, uh, but in just real small increments moving forward. Can I chime in on that, ma'am? Absolutely. <clears throat> <laughs> We can have all the discussion you want, but on the culture issue, we frickin' earned a title to be United States Marines. <laughs> and we are damn proud of it. And you can have at whatever dot mill you want to have, but you are not changing my culture to put Marine dot mill. <laughs> but I'm open to discussion. <laughs> All right, one, one last question, and then I have one of my own for the panel. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Haywold with uh, Gartner Research, Defense, and Intel. And I want to thank all of you for being here today and taking time out in your service, as well as the leadership we have for uh, General Pilot for making this all happen. This common theme of living in the silos is getting really pretty interesting, and having everybody here, and uh, Terry Dekai, uh, the memo 8. Uh, August from OMB kind of says like you're in charge of DOD with the portfolio now. So how is that going to work with everybody having an enterprise and to working together and then bringing the governance back in that you're working at one team so you get back all that white space for R&D and the capabilities you need and not waste on underperforming programs, duplication, <coughs> stuff that doesn't make sense. Well, let, let me start out on that. Um, first of all, I don't have any illusion that it makes a lot of sense for me to try to cr control um, the $38 billion and even more of what we spend. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, quite frankly, a construct that would never work. Um, and it shouldn't work. Because the work that the, is being done in the services is the real work. Uh, and it's the work that's really closest to those that need that work done. And the, the, the job that's being done out there um, for all the challenges we have of it being done multiple different ways is getting done, and it is getting done very, very well. We'd like for it to cost a little less, and we'd like for it to be a little less painful, but I think it's very important for us to know it's getting done. Um, and so really the challenge, I think, for us is to now understand how, first of all, this group gets all the authorities that they need, because there's still some challenges within each of the services, short of the Marine Corps. 
Um, and then to decide at a, an overall DOD level, how do we bring it together, particularly as we look at it from a COCOM perspective. So we're not about, and I'm certainly not about central control, um, but I am about us having a way of looking from an enterprise perspective moving forward. And, you know, one, in fact, of the discussions that we're going to have is um, now that the OMB memo is out, I think it energizes all of us. It's not just a me thing. It's not just a DOD CIO. It's really around what are the authorities that the CIOs have. And certainly this group, you know, has the, the majority of the uh, IT uh, activity and spend. But, you know, there's a number of CIOs. I don't even know how many CIOs there are in DOD. Um, and all of those are areas that we have to get more control over what we're spending. We've got to look at that spend much differently, and we've got to make sure that that spend's going to maximum capability. That's certainly Terry's perspective, but, you know, I'd open it up to the group. No, I agree with all, all you said. I mean, there, and, and, and by Clinger Cohen, there's only five, by the way, ma'am, authorized CIOs, each of the, you and each of the mill depths um, that, that are working it. So we just have to, as we talked to you about last time, is just get that top cover and, and, uh, and those authorities uh, that we need as we do this. So. Yeah. so, and that actually leads into my closing question for the group. Uh, and that is, what is it that you need from me? What are the things that you need from my office to be able to make you successful? <clears throat> Ma'am, before I get to that, I want to publicly thank General Pollitt before I close here publicly for you, sir, for your help, guidance that you've done for the Marine Corps and uh, how you've helped me along, and I appreciate that very much, the work that you and your people have done for, for us and continue to do. Uh, you're a blessing. Uh, you're a breath of fresh air. Uh, I am very, very happy that you are in the position you are. I would ask that you, one, don't take another position. <laughs> don't leave. <laughs> for, the, for, these, for these reasons is, is you let us do our jobs. You ask us for our input. You make us feel part of the process. Whether you agree with us or not, we are part of the process, which makes us feel good. We are invited to your meetings. You keep us informed. Um, you are going to set some standards and policy, um, and we will adhere to it. Um, but you ask us for advice, and, and you, I sense and know from the bottom of my heart that you are a facilitator for not only my success, but the success of the Marine Corps, and for that we are indebted. Thanks. So don't change. Thank you. Thank you. So given that, what else do we need? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the answer is, uh, I honestly believe with this CIO box needed kicking. And, and you've done a great job, ma'am, in, in, in getting this thing moving. And also, but in applying governance and using your authorities to apply governance in the process and still giving us a box just big enough to work in. And, and, uh, and like Kevin, we, I appreciate uh, your flexibility uh, to be able to do that. You've been a, more of a uh, uh, cohort and a facilitator, and that's really what we need. Uh, there's no doubt that sometimes we get in our uh, individual cylinders of excellence uh, as we push forward to our mission set, and that we don't, uh, and that I don't call General Lawrence and go, hey, I got a problem, what are you doing about this? But the, that steady battle rhythm that you've established and, and the authority, and it's, it's the way that you're using authority that's making money for us today. So, uh, you know, given that we've just sucked up in public, I... I <laughs> and it was free. <laughs> it, was, it was free. Yeah. But, but uh, that facilitation is, is absolutely crucial, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, ditto, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't set this up, guys. So I really, you know, we really want But there, there's two points that we got to work on, uh, and, and General Lord's going to expand, I think, on one of them, is that a, a vision without funding is a hallucination. Uh, you have got to get some top, you've got to fight for us there in that area. But, but more importantly, we, you've got to, we've got to roll our sleeves up, and we have to stop just talking about IT acquisition reform, we have to get after it. Yeah. 
Um, it is too complicated. Buying IT like we buy tanks is insane. And we're just going to have to work this through. And so I'm going to pass that one to you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I absolutely agree with you. And I absolutely agree with you. And I think um, we've got a lot of good work already done in terms of establishing what we need to do, but we have not taken it that next step right. to say, how are we going to actually implement? What are the areas we're going to go after? And then back to the cultural question, what are the institutional barriers that we need to take on? So you're right. It's mine, and I'm accepting it, and <laughs> it's something we got to go work on. Absolutely. Very good. Ma'am, I'd echo uh, everything that was said. Um, Carol, thank you for the invitation for, uh, for all of us. Uh, Ma'am, thanks for loaning Carol to us. Yes. Um, uh, you bring a wonderful industry perspective that we don't. And so that is of, of huge value to us. Um, your top cover, your advocacy uh, for, for resources in the resource fight, and your integration of what we're doing, I think, are the things that... You, and, and you have... I used to say, you know, we were all the best of friends. And I was, used to say this in public that when we did battle, we were not doing battle between one another. We were doing battle between ourselves and the third floor. You have changed that dynamic. Seriously, you have changed that dynamic. Um, we, uh, we, I don't, as a service, view you as the foe. Yeah, so, um, well, I'm going to take that well, thank you. and thank run you. with thank it. You. So, thanks very much, everybody, for being on the panel, and thank all of you.